victory in life. You know, in a moment, we're going to read through this story and find out about how Abraham's faith helped him look for victory. And so these are some things I want you to look for as we read the story. First of all, Abraham was in a sweet spot of fellowship with God. Remember, he had the famine come along, and he left the place that God had told him to go to. The first test of his faith there in the land. And he went, and he comes back. And then he had problems with Lot, and he's now in the right place. He's in a good place of a relationship with God. He's not struggling. He's not wandering off, going somewhere he shouldn't be. Not only was he in the sweet spot of fellowship with God, but he is prepared for battle. We'll look at that in just a minute. He's not caught off guard. He was prepared for battle battle he wasn't caught off guard and the third thing is he acted quickly and decisively he acts quickly and decisively believing that God will give him the victory now we're going to look at these three things in connection to our lives in just a moment but the first thing we want to do is read through Genesis chapter number 14 We're going to start there in verse number 8. And we're going to see how God caused Abraham's faith to grow to the point where he just looked to God for victory. He just did as he should, connecting to God to get the victory in this terrible situation. Remember we learned last week that Lot, his nephew, had decided to move away from Abraham and to head to the south, and he ends up in the city of Sodom and the area of Gomorrah. And so um, Abraham is in the right place. He's living in the right place with God. And Lot's down there. It says he pitched his tent that way, and he kept moving closer, and eventually he ends up sitting in the gates of the city as a person of importance. That's a whole other message. But let's look and see what happens, starting with verse number 8. The king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in the valley of Siddim against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amramphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fell. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they, the enemy, took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. It was a thing that would happen then, and it still happens today in battle and warfare. The, to the victor goes the spoils. So Lot settled firmly in Sodom and Gomorrah. While he's there with his family and all of his goods, all of a sudden these kings come down from an area and attack Sodom and Gomorrah. We, those is read for verses 1 through 7, which we didn't read. And so the kings that were connected to Sodom and Gomorrah went up to battle and they lost. And when they lost... They lost so big that the other kings said, we get to spoil you. We get to go after all your goods, everything that you have in your cities. We get to take that. To the victor, go the spoils. So they went and they took everything. And they also took Lot, Abraham's or Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So they took Lot and his family, and everything Lot had, and left. Remember, Abram and Lot have separated, gone two different directions. But that doesn't mean that Abraham is not concerned for his nephew and his nephew's family and his nephew's belongings. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew... For he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. 
When he's in that place, he's in the place God has told him to go. God said, I want you to leave your homeland, I want you to travel, and he ends up in the land of Canaan. And God says, everywhere you put your foot, that's going to be your place for eternity. That's your land. That's where your generations will dwell, where your descendants will dwell. And so Abram's not in Egypt. He's not far down in the south in the Sinaitic Desert. He's not gone back home to visit his family. He's in the right place where he's supposed to be. And the news comes that his nephew has been taken. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive... He armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house. That's important to see because he is prepared for battle. Do you see that? It doesn't say that he had to raise an armed force, that he took a couple of weeks and he took a couple of months to get guys together and to train them how to be in battle it says when he heard his brother was, uh, his nephew had been taken captive he armed his 300 and trained 18 trained servants they were already trained on what to do when it came time we have seen no other indications anywhere in abraham's life that he has to deal with this kind of a situation this is the first time and the last time that we see him taking up arms. But he's ready for it. He's prepared for it. Do you see that? And they went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night. And, attacked, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he moved quickly and decisively. He didn't waste time trying, well, should I really? It's just Lot. I mean, we were already separated from each other. Why would I go after the ones that have attacked him and captured him? And he may not even be alive. No, when he heard the news, he was prepared and trained. He was in the right place with God. He was prepared and trained and ready to go. And then he acted quickly and decisively. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take care of this. And he even did it by night. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother, Lot, and his goods as well as the women and the people. So God gives him a tremendous victory. It's Abram and how many men? 318. Against how many kings and all their forces? Five. Those are not real good odds. Sort of like the story of Gideon going against the armies that were opposing Israel. But he moves and does this, and God gives him a tremendous victory. Those are some big things to see in this story. And so we want to look at these things, how this can affect me. So how my faith can help me look for victory. How my faith can help me look for victory. Well, we said the first thing is, is that Abram was in the sweet spot of fellowship with God. We need to be in the sweet spot of fellowship with God if we're going to get victory. Well, what are you talking about, Pastor Walt? What do you mean the sweet spot of fellowship with God? We need to be in a good place with God. Are we, have we been reconciled to Him? Are we a believer? Have we been sanctified? Are we in the right place with God? Or are we playing the prodigal? Or are we not connected to God in any way? We need to be in the sweet spot. So let's look at some verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. We need to be in the right place with God if we're going to expect victory to happen. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Before you met Jesus, what was your life like? What was your life like? This is what it means by being in the sweet spot. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we were like the rest of the world, but we believed in Jesus Christ and our life is changed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Such were some of you. But you've been washed, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Did you trust in Him to be your Savior? If so, you are in the movement of being sanctified. He is making you holy by causing the sin to leave and being convicting you to change your life. And when it says you are justified, remember, it's easy to remember what justification means. Just as if I never sinned. That's what justified means. Just as if I'd never sinned. Does that sound like a sweet spot with God? It does like, sound like it to me, amen? amen? To be in the right place. So if I want to have victory, I need to be in the right place of fellowship. We'll look at one more verse in Ephesians. It's a little longer reading, so we'll go through it quickly. Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit and wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe? According to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in all the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is come. Amen? talking about Jesus Christ and what happened because he died on the cross for us and because he's God's son he is the Lord he is the Lord Jesus Christ so he is seated at the right hand of God far above every principality and power and might not only this age but is that's a, that which is to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I want to be as close to Jesus Christ as I can possibly be to be in the sweet spot. So I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to be in church faithfully, and I'm going to be around, and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. You may not want to admit it. But there may have come a time in your life when you were scared. Terrified. Maybe you still are of things that live under the bed. And might have a hand come up from under the bed and reach over and touch you while you're sleeping. I had that great fear and Katie would come in sometimes and she doesn't want to wake us up, but she wants to wake us up. So she just sort of stands there and looks at us and she might like reach across and touch the shoulder on the other side. It seems like this, you know, and, and it's like, whoa, what are you doing? I'd rather you just say, dad, wake up when you come into the room. Okay, don't scare me like that because I'm thinking of that arm coming up from under the. Ah! When that happened, when I was a kid, I turned to mom or to dad, right? I want to get close to them because Nobody's going to mess with my dad. And nobody's going to mess with my mama, even though she's a little shorter. Right? I look for that. I want to be close to Jesus. I want to be in that sweet spot close to Him. I want to know what He's doing. I want to be close to Him. 
and because and he has the power and he has all that. So we need to be in the sweet spot of fellowship with God. If we're saved, amen, we've gotten that far, now let's work to stay there and not walk away from God, not cause another uh, thing to come between us and Him. Let's stay in a sweet spot. The next thing that we saw is that we need to be prepared for the battle, not caught off guard. We are going to face a battle. I'm not talking about go get your CCW and we'll have a special thing where you can bring your gun in the church and we might go to battle out here. We're talking about spiritual warfare. We're talking about warfare uh, with things happening in your life. We will face the battle. Donnie Potter uh, said to me one time, um, he said uh, the passage that we're going to read here in a minute, he goes, Pastor Walt, I read that passage and claim it every day and he goes and i don't understand it seems like i have all kinds of turmoil at my house and at work and just stuff going on and i go dude if you're asking for the armor of god to be put on you are not going to just sit around the house and the armor of god and nothing's going to happen if you're going to armor up it means you're ready to go to battle When I played football and I put a uniform on with all those pads, I didn't like sitting on the end of the bench. I wanted to get out and play football if I'd gone to all that trouble. So if you're going to put on the armor of God, which we need for the battles we're going to face, then you better be ready to go to to work. I just won't put the armor of God on. Well, let's look at what it says. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Are you prepared for the battle? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Sounds like a sweet spot. Amen? Amen. Put on the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, wiles is an old English word that means against his sneaky, dastardly, if that's something you remember, attacks. Evil. He's going to come against you. So you need to put on the armor of God. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith. I have to laugh. I, I watch some of these old movies like Lord of the Rings. Well, it depicts an older time and they've got these little tiny shields, you know, or I watch something like Spartacus or something like that and they've got these little round shields and it's, they're fighting and they're blocking the... I want the biggest shield that they can possibly get. If I can get behind it and not be seen at all, amen. I want my faith to be big. Take the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Anybody have been hit by a dart? You went somewhere and they were having a dart throwing thing and you happened to walk by and it didn't stick in the dart board, it stuck in you. Anybody like that? Or one of your siblings did it when you weren't looking. Okay, it's painful enough to get hit with just a dart. Can you imagine if it was on fire? That's what Satan's throwing at us. He's in battle against us. Folks, he already owns the world. They already belong to him. He's after us. That's why we got to put on the armor. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So armor up, dear believer. Be ready for the battle. How can you have victory if you're not ready for the battle? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. You are all sons of the light. And sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, 
as others do, but let us watch and be sober. To be sober means we're paying attention, we're not distracted. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day, that's us, putting on the bre- be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. But Paul is saying we should be awake and ready to go. Dwight, when you were playing basketball, we didn't have cell phones yet. I I won't embarrass you and put you on the spot, but you didn't get to the place you got to be in the basketball realm by being distracted by cheerleaders or by somebody in the stands sitting on the bench. You know, uh, I I can imagine see kids sitting on the bench getting ready to go in the game and they got their cell phone out and they're playing instead of paying attention to the game. Man, my coach wanted me to know what was going on. I want you to go guard that guy. I want you to take care of this. And so probably that was that way with you. You didn't get to where you got in the basketball realm by not paying attention. Folks, we got to be paying attention. Are you aware of what's going on around us in the spiritual realm? We need to be ready. Put our armor up. We don't have time to, well, I'm just going to go take a nap somewhere spiritually. I heard a pastor yesterday that was teaching me about tutoring and uh, pastor gill is an awesome guy very humble man and actually his daughter rachel was the music director here uh, this guy that was teaching us gil de rosa de la rosa and uh, he said that uh, he was at a church in el monte and he got sick with cancer and uh, so he had somebody come and take that church and so he retired although he stays busy he goes Pastors never really retire. They just keep going. That's what I want to do. That's where I want to be. I want to just keep going for the Lord. If I can't pastor, then God can give me something else to do because we're facing a battle in our own lives and for others. We need to be praying and we need to be armoring up and and doing those things. We need to be prepared. Are you prepared? The next thing is we need to act quickly and decisively believing. We need to act quickly and decisively believing. Joey Candillo. I've met him a couple of times. We're friends through Facebook. He pastors in Kansas City. And he posted something. He said, February 9th, and I forget the year that he said. It was a few years ago. He said, I had to report to prison to begin my sentencing. And he said, my buddies and I went out the day before and we partied hard. And he said, I showed up at prison drunk and stoned on meth. And he said, but while I was in prison, I met Jesus Christ. And he said, I wouldn't trade that for anything. It was almost like he was saying, I was glad I got sent to prison so I could meet Jesus. And who knows whether or not he read a Gideon Bible while he was there. But he's there. And so he posted, I I, I forget if it's 23 or 27 years clean and sober. Because when he found what he needed, he acted quickly and decisively and got it in his life. And now he's pastoring, has a lovely family, and is doing a great thing in the name of Jesus Christ. We've got to act quickly and decisively, believing that God can give us the victory. We can't just sort of let it go. Do you believe that he'll give you the victory? Let's look at two verses. The first one's in 2 Corinthians, two passages. Chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 
the part that I want you to see is bringing every, th- every thought into captivity. If you want to have victory over lust, Jesus said if a man looks upon a woman and lusts after her and thinks about her, then he's guilty of the sin of adultery. If he just thinks about it. So to start off, you need to start right now. I don't even want to have that thought. I want to bring that thought into captivity. Guys, if you have a problem with that, then maybe you ought not to be looking at women that way. Maybe you... Huh. Jesus said, if your right eye offends you, poke it out. It's better for you to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two eyes. But we need to be careful. You see, that's something that we get started on. Or if you start feeling defeated and I'm just going to give up on God, wait a minute, I need to take that thought into captivity. Because I don't want to be defeated. I know God can help me get the victory. And so I'm going to stop that thought in its tracks. Give me the Bible. I want to read the Bible. And you pick up the Bible and you start reading it and God gives you a verse that speaks to your heart because the Bible is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of bone and marrow and of soul and spirit. And God works through His Word to cause things to happen in your life. And so that can help you get those thoughts into captivity before you even start. So whatever it is, that is going to look to defeat you if you can get those thoughts into captivity. Say, I give this over to you. (laughs) Casting all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Right? And He has begun a good thing in you, is faithful to complete it. Right? So don't be defeated. Whatever it is that you're facing... If it's sin, if it's depression, discouragement, whatever defeat, pastor, you don't know what it's like. First, let's get your thoughts into captivity to where you're saying it all needs to be lined up with what God wants it to be lined up with. 1 John 5, verses 4 through 5. For whatever is born of God... John 1.12 says, if we believe, we become the children of God. So if you're born of God, you overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith in who? Faith in Chevrolet? Chevrolet has let me down a few times. How about you? Faith in Ford? Faith in Honda? Faith in Toyota? Faith in... uh, Merrill Lynch, faith in Jesus. Jesus is the only one that will never let you down. Faith in the Bank of America, no. Faith, faith in the Kansas City Chiefs, I almost let everybody down last Sunday, right? No, we can't have faith in anything but in Jesus. He will help us overcome. Who is he that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you want to overcome things that are happening in your life? You need to act quickly and decisively. You need to be prepared for battle. Put on the armor of God. You need to be in the sweet spot with God if you want to have that victory. If you sing, faith is the victory. My life has changed because of Jesus Christ. He has given me the victory. He's enabled me to be clean for all these years. He's enabled me to do this in the name of Jesus Christ. What can you say to that today? Abram had tremendous victory because he just trusted in God. How many men? 318 against five kings and their armies. And God gave him the victory and he brought everything back. The Sodom and Gomorrah. And we've not read about that victory a whole lot, but that's a pretty good sized victory. It's just sort of, you just sort of read over it as you're reading through Genesis and don't pick up on that. But you know what? As he believed that God would give him victory, God can give me the same kind of victory over sin, over discouragement, over depression, over wickedness. I will look by faith to the Lord for victory in life 
That's what we have to do. Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. My question to you today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, are you looking to Him for faith to give you victory in things you're struggling with? I'm not struggling with anything, Pastor. Uh, Sure you are. Because I can tell you right now, I struggle with getting the victory in my life. The victory over sin, the victory over depression, discouragement, the victory over things like that. And I have to look to God because He is the only one that can help me get victory. I need to be close to Him. I need to be prepared for battle with putting on the armor of God. And I need to say, I am going to do this and take care of it now. I'm going to rip that Band-Aid off. I'm going to take care of it right now. Are you willing to do the same? Is there anyone here that would say, Pastor Walt, will you pray for me that I might have faith to have victory in my life? I just want you to slip your hand up for just a minute so I can pray for you. Okay, I see those hands. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Is there anyone else? I see that hand. Thank you. If you're, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, He is the only one that can give you victory. And I'm happy at the end of the service to take you aside. If you come and take me by the hand and say, tell me who Jesus Christ is. Tell me about Jesus Christ. I'd be thrilled to do that for you today. But I want to pray for you that you'll have victory. Dear Heavenly Father, as I look around the room and I see all these believers and and I know their stories and their heartaches and their struggles, some of them, Lord, uh, I pray for them that you might help them to get the victory through faith. Lord, Satan wants to tell us that we're defeated. But we know somebody that's a victory over Satan. Lord, you have the victory over death over the penalty of sin. You have the victory over Satan. He is not your equal. He is an underling. He is an angel, a created being that went wrong. But Lord, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you will be victorious. And we look to you to give us the victory, whether it's over our addictions, whether it's over our sin, whether it's over our discouragement and depression. Lord, you can give us the victory if we'll just look to you. Lord, I pray for these that raise their hands and for myself, that we'll be in a sweet spot with you. We'll be in the resting in the place that we're supposed to be with you, that you want us to be in. And we'll be prepared. We'll put on the armor. We'll be ready for whatever Satan wants to bring. And we'll act quickly and decisively. We won't dither around. We won't waste time. We'll take care of it right now. Help us to grow in our faith to have the victory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, if you'll come, please. As they're coming, we have a couple of announcements, and then Delia is going to tell us about what's happening. Um, Tonight, at 6 o'clock, Sunday supper, and we're going to be having whatever you bring. Hopefully it's Italian, but if it's not Italian, that's okay. Um, In your bulletin, you see this. Everybody have one of these in their bulletin? This is for you to give out, sorry, I got it upside down, for you to give out, to invite somebody. It's got the times of our services on the back. Uh, Sunday at 11 a.m., Sunday supper at 6 p.m., the second and fourth Sundays, and Wednesday at 6.30. So if you want to invite somebody, we have some extras that we can give you if you want to use more than one, but this is just something for you to use. A lot of people, they just won't come in randomly although some have some of you have come in here randomly but a lot of people if we would just invite them and say hey come with me to church they'll come if we just invite them but we have to invite them first we have to invite them so that's why we're providing you with this so that you can invite your friends and your neighbors and maybe even an enemy or two so we're going to have prayer and then Delia is going to tell us about her program Mike would you pray for the offering please
40 Days for Life campaign. And just a quick overview again, what 40 Days for Life is. We are standing out in front of the Planned Parenthood here in Chula Vista, praying for an end to abortion and for the salvation of life, both the unborn, for the women, the men that are going there, and even for the workers of Planned Parenthood. So our focus is to have a presence there so that people who are driving by or walking in are seeing that there are people against abortion and that maybe there's a purpose for that. Maybe there's a reason why we are standing there in prayer and, and helping people to find out more about that, about what it means to stand up for life. So we're inviting you to come to our 40 Days for Life Spring Kickoff Rally, which is going to be in two weeks on February 23rd. So this flyer is outside. It is uh, going to be at 2.30 p.m. We're going to be in front of the Planned Parenthood. And then at 3 o'clock, uh, we're going to just walk around the corner to Westside Community Church. So we're going to start off in prayer and songs over at the site and then walk over to have a potluck and then talk a little bit more about what it means to be a part of the 40 Days for Life, how to sign up for it. Um, it's not a lot of time that we're asking for. It's, you know, if you can do one hour a week, one hour a day would be great. If you want to do three hours a day or something like that, it's all up to you. And what you can do is look at this paper right here, which is going to be on the back table. This tells you all the 40 days that we are going to be there. And you choose the time that is right for you. If you want to do like for myself, I'm doing every Saturday and Sunday, and I have my specific hours that I'm going to be there. So you choose what it's going to be. So we invite you to be a part of that for us. If you just want to learn about the 40 Days for Life and just want to come to the kickoff, maybe you're not sure yet if you want to be a part of it, but you still want to hear more, the kickoff is a great time to do that. Um, and just on a side note, uh, if you know anybody who needs diapers, we're doing a free diaper giveaway um, distribution over at Silent Voices at the um, our site today, and it's every second Sunday of the month, so you can pick up one of those flyers as well. Thank you. True. Amen. Amen. Pray for her to call. Amen. 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 Thank you for that report. Jerry, will you close our service in prayer, please, sir?